and I got it recording. Okay, so oral fish of class, hopefully that is the chapter that corresponds with the fifth edition in your um, in your Darby and Walsh book, because some of these slides, two years ago, we were working off of the fourth edition. So I, I have gone through and hopefully updated it all. Um, but if for any reason ever anybody's like, that's not the right chapter, then just let me know and I can change it on the PowerPoint. But I do believe I had updated that already. So we're going to talk about oral facial clefts to start out with. These are the objectives. We're going to um, talk about the incidence, prevalence, and etiology, some uh, educating, how to educate patients and caregivers about some of the um, oral risks that they have, some um, oral complications and increased risks. We're going to describe the dental hygienist's role in planning their um, individualized care for prevention and various treatments. And then we're going to discuss the importance of the interprofessional collaboration. It's pretty complex when somebody has, you know, if it's just a cleft lip, it's not usually that big of a deal, although there still are um, uh, plastic surgeons and different things involved. But if it's more complex, then there's a lot of people involved, a lot of professions involved um, in the, the planning of that. So it can, there can be quite a bit of interprofessionalism that has to take place with the healthcare. So the failure of the lip and the palate tissue to close during embryonic development. Um, and one of the most common craniofacial abnormalities um, and birth, birth defects. Um, and it can, it can vary. You can have just a bifurcated uvula. You can have just a cleft lip on one side, or it can be um, uh, unilateral or bilateral. Um, and then you can have it going into the palate as well. So there's many different stages. Um, it's a congenital anomaly and it can be expressed in these various ways. And it can also, what's missing here, I should have added this, is um, it can happen under the mucosa as well. So very oftentimes you would visually see it, you'd see the cleft, but sometimes the mucosa has covered, but it's the bony structure underneath that didn't come together. So it can, it can happen in a variation of different ways. There are more common ways, but um, it can express itself in various ways. So it's the most prevalent birth defect in the U.S. It affects somewhere around seven, you know, seven to 8,000, 6,800 to 8,000 infants per year. It's uh, most common in um, Asian or Asian ancestry uh, population and least common in the African-American population. Um, amongst ethnic groups. So it's more predominant also um, for males to have it as opposed to females to develop um, a cleft of some kind. But if a female is going to express a cleft, um, oftentimes it's just occurring with the lip um, and not as severe of a, of a case. Yeah? So is it uh, females are more likely to have just the palate or just the lip? Just the lip. Girls are more likely to have, oh, a cleft palate without a cleft lip. So just the palate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. So they're more likely to, to maybe not have as much um, noticeable on the outside as guys are or males. So here are some, um, you may or may not know, depending on how old you are or what kind of shows you like, but here are some famous um, males with um, cleft lips. I, who knows if how severe, if they actually involve their palate or not. So no, you know, that's beyond my understanding of their situation. But you can see their scars a little bit, especially on Joaquin Phoenix. His is probably the most obvious, but Cheech Marin and Peyton Manning, they also, you can, um, I can't really see Peyton Manning's very good, at least not in that picture. And I don't watch football, so I don't know. But maybe somebody else has noticed that before on him. The so oral facial clefts is the failure of the lip and or the palate to close during um, embryonic development. And um, the characteristics, it results from a malformation or a deformation or a disruption in the formation early, early on in the embryo changes. So it's present at birth, 
And it has serious effects depending on how large the cleft is. Um, but even if it's just minor, it can have a lot of effects on the baby's ability to eat, um, form a good seal and suck. Um, and so there's lots of um, serious developmental, functional and health um, things that we have to think about um, for a baby that has a cleft lip or cleft palate. So we'll talk a little bit more about the categories here in just a second. So it can be associated with a syndrome. So why, it ha like, why does it happen? So something in um, genetically gets disrupted during the embryonic formation. So oftentimes it's a syndrome. There's more than like 300 syndromes that could occur um, and they're mostly rare. So then we look at other things like genetics, family history, has somebody else in the family had it? or um, environmental, is something, something that maybe the mom was doing during the pregnancy or wasn't able to access like some kind of nutrient, perhaps they were um, ingesting some kind of a drug or it can also um, happen during some kind of prescription medications. You can see it can possibly be linked to vasoactive or anticonvulsant anti medications. So calcium channel blockers, phenytoids, um, the beta blockers or vas vasoconstrictor. So there are times when um, those have been possibly indicated as um, something that could trigger a cleft lip or a cleft palate. Okay, so here we can see a little bit of the embryonic formation. Um, and so a formation of the lip is um, the fifth week in utero. So super early. So like before you probably even know you're pregnant, it's happening. So that's kind of scary because I mean, a lot of women who get pregnant, they might not be ingesting the right amount of folate or they might be still, maybe they're still drinking or still using a recreational drug or something like that. So it happens so, so early. Um, so lack of fusion of the medial, nasal, and maxillary processes that form the philtrum, that's for the formation of the lip. Formation of the palate, between five to 12 weeks, most women know they're pregnant by six to eight weeks. I mean, I suppose somebody, that's when I figured it out. I guess you could know sooner, but um, probably not as likely. But formation of the palate between five to 12 weeks in utero, cells do not penetrate the grooves between the medial, nasal, and maxillary processes. Primary and secondary develop separately and may occur at different locations and at different times. So they just don't synergize and do what they're supposed to come together and fuse. They might develop at two separate times um, or you know, whatever is happening on an embryonic level, but it's not doing that typical coming together and sealing in the, in the medial um, palate. So uh, again, a couple more, just breaking up the different ways that it can express itself. You can have the cleft lip, it can be unilateral or it can be a complete cleft of the lip. Um, it can happen, um, you can see it can happen both sides. And this is actually, I think this is depicting the lip and then this would be depicting the palate. You can see it can happen unilaterally or bilaterally um, for the, Palatal clefts, it can be a cleft lip and the alveolus, or it can be a cleft lip and the primary palate. You guys don't have to remember all of these. This isn't going to be on a, on a quiz or an exam, but you should know the basics that it can be in just in the lip in the palate. You can have a cleft in the uvula, or it can be submucosal, meaning you can actually see it. There's an image of that coming up here where the cleft is in the bone, but it's covered with mucosa. So you can actually see it. So here's a picture of an incomplete unilateral cleft and then a bilateral cleft. So more of a complete cleft. And this to me looks like a computer generated. I don't think it's real, obviously, because it's the same baby in both pictures. Super cute baby though. Here's some real images of um, a cleft palate, but no cleft lip. So this, maybe this is a female. Um, and then we have a unilateral cleft 
and the lip. This is uh, bifurcation of the uvula. And then this one over here also looks, you can see the cleft goes all the way through and then in the back. This is kind of hard to look at because you're looking at a reflection of, you know, that like this is, one of these is the mirror. I think, I think this might be, so it's kind of hard to, make out what you're actually looking at. But here's the main clef and then the clef toward the back of the palate, the soft palate. And then some more um, images. You can see how just it opens up totally up into the sinus area. The palate's just wide open, but there's no clef in the lip. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then this is just part of, you know, just because the lip didn't form. So you have just this mass of tissue that just didn't go into the right place. So areas that would be like, you know, part of the nose and part of the lip and part of the um, alveolar ridge is just everything is just kind of bunched up and didn't separate into where it should be. So these can take several surgeries. Here's just a simple like clef of the uvula. You can see the uvula is cleft in the back. That's not probably nearly as big of a deal or would require anything necessarily any surgery. And then this is submucosal. So I'm sort of sort of guessing that there's a cleft back in here just because of the way the tissue looks. And you can see the uvula is I don't know if the uvula is cleft and it's just touching, you know, sometimes the, the uvula can come over and touch the side of the soft palate. I'm not sure if that's actually kind of like adhered or if it's, if it's um, just like, this is what their uvula looks like. I'm not sure what that is, but you can see there's the opening here. And then I sort of imagine just because of the way this looks that this is open underneath this mucosa all through here, just because it has a strange look. The coloration of the palette looks strange to me. So I think that that would be open, but it's covered with mucosa. Okay. So for surgery, for treatments, there's um, a lot of stages in the surgery process. They'll, um, they'll only do them at certain places like the lip, they would might do well, the baby's still quite young, but soft palate, they're gonna wait to six to 18 months. And then for a hard palate, even longer, it's gonna be years. So that would be a lot of feeding issues that they're gonna to have to work through. Then there's the abturators, which we looked at for just a second. You saw an image of that last week. And we talk about that even more, I think in the, pros the oral prosthesis um, PowerPoint. But this um, is going to be something that a patient would use until they're able to have surgery to close that cleft. And then orthodontics, once that surgery is done, they could have congenitally missing teeth and there's all kinds of other orthodontic issues and then restorative dentistry. So it's, it's a pretty lengthy process of what they have to go through to get themselves back to, you know, somewhat of you know, a normal state, they're gonna to have to address all these different issues um, as the appropriate time comes. So for the interprofessional piece, you can see there's like a huge list of potential people who could be involved. You, um, you're gonna always, always have a plastic surgeon and a pediatrician, but then the dentist or a pediatric dentist orthodontist, and then things like speech pathologists, um, the, the different, anybody who's addressing psychological issues, if it's been, you know, like whatever comes around any of those, you get the social worker and the psychologist. And then I'm not entirely sure the role of the geneticist, but that, you know, could be an option in the book. It talks about that. Audiology, there's a lot of connection in this whole area between the sinuses, the ears and the opening of that area causing uh, problems with hearing and um, um, recurrent ear infections. So there's so many more. And then the prosthodontist, if they have an obturator, obturator. So there's so many different possible specialists who would be involved in caring for a person with a cleft.
So some of the oral complications and the physical complications, so there's the feeding difficulty would be straight out the gate. That would be one of the biggest issues. Difficulty creating that negative pressure or that sucking for bottle or breast, whichever they're doing. <clears throat> and then there's the nasal regurgitation. So if they, it kind of comes back up into their nasal cavity <clears throat> and then it's gonna be more difficult for them to feed. So it's gonna take longer. They're just gonna have the difficulty sucking, you know, to begin with. So they're not gonna get as much food. Um, they might take in more air. And so then they have more maybe upset tummies and like the tummy problems from um, frequent needing to be burped more often. And then when we think about their tooth development, they may have congenitally missing teeth because of it. Um, oftentimes you'll be seeing, it'll be a, like a lateral or a canine would be the most common just simply because of where the clefts are located. Supernumerary teeth, um, morphologically deformed, hypoplastic, thin, missing underdeveloped enamel, hypoplastic enamel or hypomineralized decreased mineral content. So there's not as much mineral or it's um, just kind of thinner and, or just missing, it's not there. So in children with oral facial clefts, the most common problem is a middle ear, um, issue or um, infections, they have a lack of ventilation from the eustachian tubes. Um, and because the, the palatal muscles um, that control these tubes, everything is sort of not quite developed the way it should be. So they end up with um, more of an issue happening in their eustachian tubes. So they get chronic ear infections and that can also affect their hearing. So that could be like long-term hearing impairment and then they can also have damage to their auditory um, sensory nerves. So in, their, um, in that area as well, it can cause some nerve damage. Um, if the problem's not addressed, if they're sort of constantly dealing with the same recurrent infections. And then of course, if they have hearing problems at such young ages, and that's gonna fall into speech, um, speech disorders and um, the need to possibly see a speech pathologist. Or developing their speech. Oh, really? Because of the chronic ear infections? Yeah. yeah. Is it go? It's going good though. He's. Yeah. Yeah. You probably learn his language faster though. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. That is very hard. Um. Oh, I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything on that slide, hold on. Oh, and then the last one, so the health of the teeth also. So um, increased caries, mouth breathing, mouth position of the teeth. Caries is gonna, um, I, there's another slide that, that refers back to specifically caries, but um, the clearing of the food, well, let me just go to that slide instead of jumping ahead and just see where we're at. Uh, I think it must be the next one. If we don't get to it, I'll, I'll go backwards. But is it the slide after this? So um, psychosocial considerations. So their, their mental health and, and how they feel, how they're perceived with the world. So just their social interaction. And there can be, you know, not only do you sort of feel uh, socially, um, like you stand out or you look different, you know, there's that whole psychological issue. Um, and then how you relate with your peers too. So they can, feeling of self-conscious, feeling just not quite as um, feeling inferior. So that can make you feel withdrawn and unresponsive. Um, scared of the healthcare professionals, because if you're poked and prodded from like the moment you come out of your mom, then you're, you know, you might have a little trouble feeling, you know, every time I go to the doctor, it's uncomfortable, whether it's because of your ears or because of your decay or because of a surgery you need. I mean, that can be quite traumatizing. Parents may be afraid of hurting their child while providing oral hygiene care. If, if it, you know, looks so different than your own mouth, it just the whole shape of it, the whole um, configuration of what is there. And if you are like, I don't recognize this tissue and I'm afraid I'm gonna hurt them, you know, to brush their teeth or help clear out the food, it can be kind of overwhelming to, to parents. So they are at a higher caries risk, three and a half times more surface decay 
Um, and the reason for that is um, it's more often the primary dentition, maxillary incisors, um, or anything that is close adjacent to that cleft because it's going to retain more food. Um, and then if they have an, this says down here at the bottom, but if they have an abturator, they're way more likely to, because think about kids, kids don't brush and floss that great anyway. And then you throw this like major appliance into their mouth, it's going to retain more plaque. They have to take it out and clean it, clean around the brackets or whatever it is that's holding it in their mouth. So it's a lot harder for them to keep their mouth clean. But not just that, there's a longer uh, time to clear food away. If they have any drainage from the nasal cavity, it kind of encourages the, um, like the stickiness of the environment. So biofilm being more sticky, food adhering. Um, they may have a softer diet, which sometimes softer diets tend to um, mean more teriogenic type food. Um, in their diet, and then the education on how to clean around these areas, how to keep it clean, keeping the parents up to date on how to how to take care of those areas, how to keep those areas clean. Um, and then once they get into ortho, that's a whole nother thing. We know ortho is always difficult to clean around. So once they get to that stage, they've probably already, if they've been with healthcare providers, they've probably already heard it a lot, but still it's just another layer it's difficult to keep those areas clean. So um, preventative measures include patients and uh, parental dietary counseling. So talking to the parents about, let me move this. Okay. Talking to the parents about um, trying to give them less sugary uh, fermentable carbohydrate type foods, frequent hygiene recalls, fluoride therapy, um, dental sealants, of course, and then um, we talked about that, reducing carrogenic foods, um, and then children with oral facial clefts, um, they're going to, so it's hard for parents to get outside of that scope of coming in more than every six months, but they're probably already, if they're already probably seeing specialists a lot anyway, so they're probably coming in to some doctor relatively frequently if they have something like this going on. But in those interims, seeing a patient every three to four months, just like when you have ortho, if you have an ortho patient that isn't keeping their teeth clean, it makes perfect sense to recommend to the patient's parents that you see them more often every three to four months. So the same goes for a patient with an oral facial cleft. Um, and then providing them with the oral hygiene home care, specializing tools to help them reach some of these difficult areas, um, and then recommending things like take-home fluoride um, therapies and things like that. And this pretty much just talks about the same thing as before. So when... Um, if we know that there is any kind of hearing um, difficulties, we want to make sure that we are, you know, clarifying that. If the child's old enough for us to communicate with them, we want to make sure that we're talking slowly enough and making it sort of a simple, a simple explanation of what they need to focus on. And then the same with the parent. The parents might have heard like a million things from a million different providers, and they might just sort of check out. So we want to make sure that we really have their attention and that we're giving them the time to actually focus on the recommendations that we have to help them with whatever oral hygiene, things that we want to recommend for them or an issue that we see in the mouth. Um, speaking um, clearly, articulating ourselves, you know, clearly to the patient and to the, and to the um, caregivers is always really important. So those are just some things to think about um, in anticipation. Now, I we used to have for the interprofessional, there used to be either um, anybody who's really interested in the interprofessional. Have you seen an oral facial clinic on any of the lists? Have, has that jumped out to you guys? Not yet. I wonder if it's every year. I'll have to email Katie because they had a clinic. I don't know if it was an ICC. 
if they brought it back, but you did see one for last year. Yeah, she liked that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Maybe I'll just, yeah. Yeah, I think I will I'll just send her an email and see if that is something that would potentially ever come back. Okay. Okay, so that's that one. You guys have any questions there? I'm gonna stop sharing that again, but don't forget. Um, okay, so you're gonna have to kind of, there, there's just not enough time to do. So I already told you the um, ortho one is totally, I'm just gonna leave that to you guys. Email me or set a time with me if you wanna review anything about that. Um, the dental implants and the peri-implant care, I do feel like there's a lot in this PowerPoint that's important, but I don't know, you might've already talked about this with Gail or with somebody. So, and then the other one, the prosthesis talks a lot about, um, well, I didn't even pull it up because I think I, I think I overruled my, I think I made the decision that this one was more important, but tell me how much did you guys talk about peri-implantitis and the, did you talk about it quite a bit? So this would be very review. I did talk about implants and then we have other Okay, good to know. So I am going to X out of this. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop sharing and let me pull up the other one. Okay, so we are on a time crunch. We have we have like 35 minutes, 34 minutes. We can do it. It's 320. It's 320 is when we're out. So and it's two, it's 246. Okay. So I might've done my math wrong, but 36 minutes, we have 36 minutes. Okay. So fixed and removable prosthesis. These are the um, objectives describe the demographics, risk factors, psychological factors associated with tooth loss, describe the hard and soft tissue changes associated with tooth extraction, list and describe the types of prosthodontic and prosthesis and discuss the challenges and associated with the um, replacement of missing teeth. These are very long objectives. Explain implications of dental hygiene care with removable prosthesis. Explain the importance of regular professional care. So I don't know, you digest those a little bit more on your own term. Those are all kind of mouthfuls, I feel like. Functions of teeth. So it, it is kind of, isn't it? Like, I mean, this one, she's kind of making a silly face. Even if her teeth were in there, it probably would look silly. But how weird do we look when we have no teeth? I mean, we really do look very strange. Um, it's just, you know, most people don't think about the importance of teeth, um, aesthetically, functionality. You know, so many people kind of cavalierly say, like, ah, just rip out all my teeth and get dentures, you know, because they just um, don't really think about the huge impact it will have on their life when they get to that point where they have to have most, if not all of their teeth extracted. So um, aesthetics is just one part of it, but it's a pretty significant part. We just don't look the same. We lose so much support, facial support and structure when, when we don't have our teeth. And then on top of that, we obviously also have the atrophy. Um, we have to know about the specialized needs of our patients, though, since we um, we see less people now. Like when I was first coming out of school, it was very common to see lots of people without um, 
teeth and having full upper and lower dentures. It's not as common anymore. There's a lot more restorative dentistry. There's a lot more partials. There's a lot more implants. So there's a lot more um, that people do. So at present, approximately one in five adults age 65 years or older in the United States or Canada are completely edentulous. But that number is, um, that number, I'm not sure exactly how many years ago that was. So it could actually, it's pretty recent, but it could be even less. There could be fewer people than that who are completely edentulous. Because like I said, people are having more restorative dentistry. Although edentulous rates have been dropping, these figures suggest that dental hygienists are likely to encounter an edentulous patient within um, your dental practice. So very, very, very likely that you're gonna see at least a couple patients that are fully edentulous, at least, um, or um, it's oftentimes what I saw mostly in practice was I would see patients with like a full upper and then they'd have some mandibular teeth and a partial or something like that. So you might see a mix, but, but to be completely edentulous, um, usually they see the dentist for like a really quick appointment. They don't always see the hygienist if they have literally not one tooth in their mouth, but you still, they might put them in your, in your um, schedule and want you to take a pano and um, go, you know, look at their tissues and stuff and then call the dentist in. So risk factors for tooth loss. So oral cancer and the corresponding treatments for oral cancer and oral injuries, um, they can contribute to tooth loss. So we also have to think about that, but there's dental caries, periodontal disease, low socioeconomic status, inadequate access to care, inability to get access to care, um, low frequency of going to the dentist in general, that could um, also attribute to like um, oral health literacy, poor daily oral hygiene, which of course reflects back up to caries and perio. Um, prior to 35 years of age, tooth loss is predominantly driven by caries. After 35, it's predominantly driven by uh, perio. Um, of course, that's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, um, you see a younger population, tooth loss usually has to do with caries. So issues experienced with tooth loss. So human re um, responses associated with tooth loss include the five stages of bereavement. And trust me, patients, this is another thing they underestimate that, that once those teeth are extracted and then all the cascading difficulties that come with getting the adjustments, realizing that eating is completely different, like there's so many things that they just don't take. And even though the dentist tries to prep them, um, but there is really that, that, that um, stages of the bereavement, behavioral changes, embarrassment of like, oh my gosh, I cannot be seen without my teeth. Um, and the loss of dignity, again, not just not feeling, you know, the same as everybody else in society. And so not feeling as dignified. These responses must be considered when providing care for edentulous patients or partially edentulous patients, because a lot of times your patient is not gonna wanna remove their denture or they will pop it out and wanna stick it right back in the minute you're done checking their tissue underneath. So it's like, will you take out your upper denture for me? And then they pop it out, you look at their tissue and then they're like grasping it and trying to shove it back in because they just feel so uncomfortable and embarrassed with it out. Not everybody, but quite a few. So you have to be sensitive to that. Um, older adults, their um, bone is going to resorb quicker than younger. Um, but if somebody loses all their teeth, you know, midlife, that's a lot of lifetime without that stability of the root in the alveolar to keep to keep the bone there. But everybody resorbs at a different rate. Some people resorb very, very quickly, and then some people not so much, so it's an individual thing. Resorption of the alveolar ridge um, diminishes stability and retention of the prosthesis as the bony ridge kind of flattens over time. So if somebody is going through a lot of changes um, in their ridge, they're gonna have to have a lot of um, um, soft denture relines or maybe even uh, something more than that. Maybe, uh, you know, they might even have to take a whole new impression if things change dramatically enough and everybody is, is different. 
Um, generally, bony changes observed in the um, mandibular arch differ significantly from those in the maxilla. The resorption rate is four times greater in the mandible than the maxilla. So highlight, highlight, star, star, star. That's a good exam question. Resorption rate four times um, more in the mandible than the maxilla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you guys could, should be able to pull it up and see all these notes. Mm -hmm. In the mandible, mm -hmm. it's in the maxilla. Okay, so issues experienced, again, we kind of touched on these already, but um, discomfort related to the um, proximity of the um, canal, the uh, mandibular canal. So if they start to get resorption and then you start to get rubbing of the prosthesis, um, they can get some nervy discomfort sensations, um, paresthesia in the lower lip and chin related to um, exposure of either the mental nerve or if they um, get... Uh, from resorption down in this area as well, diminishes um, stability and retention of the prosthesis um, as it, we already talked about that, four times greater. Um, irregular resorption can create um, sharp spikes. So in the bone, they could have an area that as it resorbs, they have an area in the bone that's almost like a spur or a spike. And that could cause a lot of discomfort because if, um, if it starts to, pop out more or express itself more as the ridge flattens and resorbs, then it'll rub more on the inside of the prosthesis. And that could be very uncomfortable. Um, difficult to fit with exotosis in the um, maxilla or um, tori in the mandible or palatal tori, mandibular torus or yeah, or palatal torus. One of these is wrong. I can't remember. I think it's palatal torus. And then um, large maxillary tuberosities can also get in the way. Decreased stability, unbalanced occlusion, TMJ disorders, all of those things, if their um, prosthesis rocks when they're you know, biting, it's not stable, um, they, can also, um, they can also start to get um, pain in their TMJ. And then just being dissatisfied with the appearance if, it, if they feel like it's too... Um, you know, bulgy, or that when they take it out, everything is just sinking, sinking, sinking. Their cheeks are sinking in because um, they're losing that, that, um, all that structural support. I'm trying to get my mouse over here. Okay, so types of prosthesis. So we have fixed um, bridges, things that are fixed, obviously that means you can't take them out. So they're prosthesis that aren't gonna go anywhere. They're fixed. So you have bridges and with bridges, you have abutments and pontics, and then you also have periodontal splints. So this is an example of like a periodontal splint. You can see there's so much bone loss that these teeth are probably quite mobile. And so they've just built up like a, a splint with composite material to stabilize those teeth. Then you have removable. Um, you can have a partial denture, which will have um, some kind of polymer plastic with either metal um, hooks, or it will be all kind of plastic polymer um, to hold it in place. Then there's the abturator, like we talked about for the oral cancer or the um, oral facial class. Complete dentures are gonna be full arch, so full palatal, full mandibular arch. And then you have um, denture, implant retained dentures. So they have these little, Janice? Say it again. There, a denture would never be like permanently fixed. You can have implant retained. And so patients can, they can be, I suppose, maybe I should clarify. There have been patients who have had a denture that the only way to actually take it off is to go in because it's um, implant retained. So they'll go in and like um, somehow the dentist accesses it and then takes it out. I've never seen a patient like that. I don't know how often that happens. I just thought of a patient that I just thought of a patient. I saw at Dr. Matsuda's office who had that. 
Thank you, Janice. So it, this is what he had. He had from canine to canine, he had three or four implants. I can't remember if it was the same number that you would typically have. I think he had three, three or four. And then he had a fixed partial prosthesis. And the only way to have it to come off was if Dr. Matt said, like unscrewed it. And it was a nightmare because he had the, his lip, his lip line to have him get up and under that fixed prosthesis with like a floss or a water. He had to like pull his lips so high. And so I, it was like, this is going to be a problem unless he gets um, an understanding of how to deal with his own anatomy and his, this new fixed prosthesis. Yes, I totally forgot about that. Thank you, Janice. So um, that was like just a section for his um, maxillary anteriors. But oftentimes, the more, the ones that I've seen far more often for the implant retained dentures are removable. So it stabilizes them, it gives them a really nice support. It helps the, the jaw or the, um, the, the ridge not to resorb as quickly because there's something in the bone. Yeah. That'd be like, yeah, so this one is, these are implant retained because there's three implants here that they snap in. So the patient can take that in and out, but they snap so they're much more stable. And then this one, actually you can see implants down here too, can't you? So that one's implant retained as well. So yeah, so those are implant retained. Okay. Oh my word, I can never get my cursor back over here. So removable partial dentures. So these are just some examples of removable. They can either have some metal or they'll do all plastic or all kind of like a polymer. Complete denture, over dentures, just some more examples. So an abutment is gonna be the part um, that holds the, the bridge on. So you have kind of the anchoring pieces and then you have the totally nothing's above it. It's like the bridge part. So you think about, you know, like if you have your, your anchoring and then you have the bridge over water, the pontic is um, the artificial tooth with no root system of any kind whatsoever. You can have a four unit bridge um, I've never, usually assistants, dentists don't like to span more than like three teeth, right? It's, have you guys seen that very often? Usually um, they'll span maybe four, but they I don't. Not, like, yeah, oh yeah. And yeah, and they, typically and we don't do that very often here, no. right? Yeah, no. it's just not as, it's, they just don't yeah, structurally, like engineering wise, it's not a great idea. So usually three is like your common, but I have seen four. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have seen canine to canine. I guess it probably depends. It's probably far less likely to see that, like you said, in the molars, because you just have more, um, yeah. There's more, more chewing and more forces back there. Okay, so abturators are um, another, it's the, uh, I'm gonna read my notes. So an abturator is a prosthesis that closes an opening um, of communication between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. And this could be because of, like we've already said, um, cancerous tumors, surgeries, could be an accident, could be congenital abnormality, like oral facial clefts. Um, but this is, an, this is something that needs to be removed, you know, quite regularly clean. And the patient needs to um, know how to do that, to scrub all that area, especially an area that would be up in the nasal cavity. Like we talked about that, um, any kind of um, drainage and stuff might be more sticky and retain, you know, it could have bacterial growth and all sorts of things. So the patient needs to know how to care for that. I have never seen one in private practice. I wish I had, because then I'd have a story to tell, but I have never seen one in private practice. Has anybody else, has anyone seen one? Assistant, no. I don't think that's hugely super duper common, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, so educating the patient. So expectations, oral hygiene instructions, prosthesis use and care, and then regular periodic maintenance appointments. So um, they just need to know all about 
all of those things that, and the dentist, if the patient's going and going to have a lot of teeth extracted, or they're going to go have a major procedure done, um, they're going to, the dentist is going to kind of prime them on all this stuff. But a lot of times what happens is they go through this whole thing and it's like, they're just like on autopilot. And then when the reality of it comes, you know, they're like, well, I don't remember him or her saying this or that, you know? And so then we have to, well, you know, and then you just have to be very empathetic, very patient, and then just stress those, those points, you know, kind of remind them of the things that, um, you know, especially when it's early on. And if the patients come in quite often for, as their tissues healing, and they kind of get this rebound kind of initial, they do all the extractions and then the tissue kind of like rebounds and remodels. Um, they, they come in quite often for adjustments. And that can be a time when you hear them just like, oh, uh, you know, so they just need a lot of sympathy and patience to get them through that difficult transition. And then once everything stabilizes, I have had patients that, I mean, you just, it's hard to know what to say to them because they'll say, I wish I had never done this. And you just feel so bad because there's no going back. I mean, the only thing they can do for at that point is to have some implants and, and help that situation that way. Um, but, you know, they'll just, they'll unload on you a little bit and they'll share their, their frustrations, you know, so you just have to be prepared with just being a listening ear and then coming up with you know, if you can think of a suggestion or something to help them, or if they're not cleaning something um, correctly, you know, saying, well, your tissue is really red, but it looks like you're not maybe taking this out enough. You have to take it out every, you know, at night to let your tissue breathe and slough off, which we'll talk more about that as we get to the, um, the oral hygiene stuff. So these are the things for education and expectation. Eating is going to be different. Speech is going to be affected. Appearance, I have to go through, blow through this kind of quickly. So all of these areas, the patient is going to find um, a significant change that they're going to have to adapt to. Um, the majority of the alveolar ridge um, occurs, the resorption occurs within the first year. They'll have a lot of adjustments within the first year. Um, the bone, we already talked about the bone resorbing far more on the mandible than the maxilla. Um, and then, but it continues to remodel and it's just going to be a different case for everybody. Some people it's going to remodel faster um, and more often. Other people it'll, it'll initially remodel and then it'll stabilize. Um, they'll need a new denture or relines are needed approximately every four to eight years. Um, and then it's important that they have some kind of an identifying marker. If they are still independent and they live at home, it's not as a big deal. But if they live in an assisted living home or nursing home, they need a permanent marker of their, um, of their denture. So some oral mucosal conditions, um, improper oral hygiene care, extended denture wear, not removing it frequently enough, and then a poor fit, just a poor fit to begin with. So factors affecting um, the oral mucosal and denture. So systemic disease, oh, go back. So some systemic diseases, um, our patients with diabetes, our patients um, that are um, owing, having like digestive tract, uh, any kind of an issue that is affecting their oral cavity from, you know, like Crohn's disease or something that's affecting their whole oral cavity, or if they have an immunocompromised um, condition and they're more prone to infections, can, um, candida, things like that, all of those things, all those systemic conditions can play a role affecting their oral cavity, just like if they had their teeth. But now they have something that has way more like crevices, it's rubbing on their tissue, it's holding um, a dark, warm space up against their, their mucosa. So now they have even kind of like a higher level of potential for ulcerations and um, candida um, albicans. So they need to be more aware of how their systemic condition can affect their oral cavity and the denture that they're wearing or the, or the partial. Um, and then of course, if they have any kind of, you know, salivary dysfunction um, or they're not gonna heal as well, if they are a patient with um, diabetes and their healing is impaired, then they have to think about that if they're having a bunch of extractions or if they have increased infection and things just might not turn around in their mouth as easily as somebody who doesn't have to deal with one of these systemic conditions. 
So they have a lot more at play. They have a lot more kind of up against them than somebody who doesn't have a chronic condition. If they have a dry mouth and they have a prosthesis, it's far more uncomfortable. It's just, just it just doesn't, their tissue just isn't gonna like that. It's just far more uncomfortable. So a lot of times they need to um, try some of those replacement salivas. They have to try like the um, xylitol sprays or the gels or the biotin. They have to um, keep a water bottle close by and do the, um, the constant swishing. Um, to help lubricate. And then if they get the cracking in the corners of their mouth, the angular colitis, on top of that from kind of drying out and then um, getting the back to the yeast, that is just an added level of discomfort. Frictional irritation, if something is not fitted right and it's rubbing, um, then they you know, have to deal with um, either just taking it out until their mouth heals and then putting, so it might be a couple days of not wearing the denture and then making sure that the denture is really cleaned and sanitized. Especially that goes um, equally as well for somebody who has uh, like a thrush or a yeast. Um, they may have to make sure that it's killed in the mouth and, and killed on the prosthesis. They can't keep re-inoculating their mouth with the yeast on the prosthesis. Um, we talk so much about xerostomia in this class um, because there's just so many conditions that cause xerostomia. So I'm just gonna um, kind of breeze through these. Um. Okay, let's talk about some, this is good. Let's talk about a few of the um, lesions that you can see in somebody's mouth who is, um, who's wearing a prosthesis. So some of the most common ones is like a frictional, um, a frictional alteration or a hyperkeratosis. Um, so this is gonna be reactive or trauma lesion. So you're gonna see this from something that's like an ill-fitting denture. You're gonna see either a sore or there could be this hyperkeratosis, which oftentimes it can, you can see kind of like almost like a couch. It looks white, the tissue looks thickened and white. So that's going to happen um, when you have um, more of an ill-fitting denture. Then you also have this denture, um, denture-induced fibrous hypoplasia, epilus fissuratum. I'll show you a picture of that. Remember that word, epilus fissuratum, because that's a great one for like a national board, a great one for an exam. But the friction of the denture starts to cause the cells to replicate and you start to get extra tissue growing. And it kind of makes this almost like a fold of tissue up in the vestibule. And when you first see it, you're like, what's going on? But it's just because the denture is either up too high in the vestibule, something's going on and it's rubbing and it causes this like kind of protrusion or fold of tissue up in the vestibule. Um, it can happen on the mandible as well. I've just seen several of them on the maxilla. I don't know why it's more common there for maybe just when they design the, the partials or the dentures. Infectious lesions, denture stomatitis. Um, this can be related to microorganisms or poor oral hygiene, angular chelitis, so like a yeast or chronic candy, um, candidiasis or a yeast. Um, and then you can have mixed. So you can have a combination of a physical injury, like a physical end bacteria infiltrating that ulcer or that, um, is your hand up, Avalon? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just had a question. So um, the way I kind of remembered it from um, the squirrel path mm -hmm. was that denture stomatitis was chronic uh, infosis candidiasis. It just, after they've had it for so long, then they get the stomatitis. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is there a reason why they're like, I was un I was under the impression it could, okay. and it could just be their different textbooks, and sometimes textbooks just do their own thing. Okay. I just remember that like chronic eosinophilia. Yeah. Like the main word, and then it was like Yeah. Because I'm thinking that in that population, it's probably the most likely reason, but I do think it can, I, I'm assuming it can happen outside of that. And I think it could just be the difference between 
the text, the textbook. Yeah, that's kind of my guess. So um, this papillary, um, this papillary hyperplasia with the cobblestone, that's a very popular one for exam questions. Um, Epilus fissuratum is another one. Um, let's see what the next. Yeah, that's probably what I'm looking for. So here's some just this blurry picture, but you can see some rubbing is making like a big old sore right there. You can see the, um, you can see a very, um, like a, a pretty, um, I don't know what word I'm looking for. Like, I want to say demarcated, but that sounds weird in my head. But anyways, you can see in the mouth here, even though it's blurry, you can see these extra red areas, especially here on this palatal torus. It's probably rubbing there. And then through here, it looks really red. Here's the epilus fissuratum. There's that fold of extra tissue. And it's again over here. That's like a fold of extra tissue. Oops, sorry. So it's also called, it can be called a denture induced fibrous hypoplasia, but typically it's called, referred to as epilus fissuratum, but they're the same thing. I'd probably say epilus fissuratum. But fibrous, fibrous hypoplasia makes sense because it's hyperplasia is just ex, you know, extra tissue and it's fibrous. So it's kind of like, it kind of makes sense just if you write it out that way and it's induced by a denture. So it sort of makes sense, but I, I think in all the assessments, um, I put fish, epilus fissuratum. So here is um, denture stomatitis. You can tell this likely is yeast induced, I would say, um, because a lot of, but I don't know how you could tell that like for a hundred percent unless you know you had other, but it's likely that that's probably one of the most common things, but patients also get it when they just never remove their um, denture or they don't very often. They just start to get like, and it could be induced from bacteria, some other bacteria that's just causing that as well. Um, so you, I think candidiasis and denture stomatitis, they do look very similar and perhaps this is from candidiasis, but I, I kind of thought you could get it from other things too, but I'm going to talk with Kathy. We're going to powwow on that. Um, and then angular chelitis, you guys have seen that before. So here's that cobblestone look on the palate, this uh, papillary hyperplasia. So you can see this kind of cobblestone look on the palate there, caused by chronic candidiasis albicans infection and chronic low-grade denture trauma. So again, likely candid candida albicans are probably the culprit very often, I would suspect, is probably your, a good educated guess. So the same with denture stomatitis, um, but also kind of like just the denture just isn't fitting real well. So not only do you have this physical irritation, but then you have the, um, you know, the fungus or the yeast or the bacteria or whatever it is. Okay. All right, there's three minutes. I'm just gonna look through. This is talking about cleansing, daily oral and denture hygiene care. These are more instructive. So I think you guys can read through these. Daily oral, recommended daily immersion. It's very, very, very important that a patient who has something going on in their mouth, it's like a, especially if it's like a yeast that they, that they cleanse things incredibly well. So they um, do a soak overnight with bleach. They treat that yeast in their mouth before they put it back in. So that's something that's really important for patients to understand. And then it's important in general, if they don't have like a candida or something like that in their mouth, super important for them just to take it out at night, let their tissues breathe and rest and all that tissue slough off. Super important that they take it out at night um, very oftentimes that's the perfect time to um, soak it in some kind of an antibacterial overnight rinse, and it just keeps everything way healthier and happier. They want to make sure that they're removing that loose debris and the bacteria that builds up and give it, a, you know, a nice brush every day so that it doesn't 
build. Once you get like a little bit of something, it's like your teeth when they get fuzzy. The minute you get that little film of plaque, it's just so much easier for more to um, build. And they can get calculus on the denture just like they can get it on their teeth. So um, that regular cleaning is super important. Um, they recommend avoiding, I've heard many times, and it doesn't make 100% sense to me, but they recommend a lot of times not using a regular toothbrush, but specifically using a denture brush. Um, and then you want to be really careful about the way you handle a, a denture. If it's a partial or it has metal, you, and if you, if you are squeezing it too hard, you very likely could bend it. Um, and then if it's slippery, it could go flying out of your hand and go sailing across the room. So it's very important that you don't squeeze something that is bendable. If it's a partial, like a, like a, just a mandibular um, partial or full arch, and it has any metal on it, make sure you can't change the shape of it. And then if it's a, you know, if it's a full arch and it's plastic, just make sure that you have lined the sink. If you're going to brush it for the patient and clean it, you want to line the sink so that you protect it from falling in the sink and breaking, but also share that knowledge with your patient so that they don't, it doesn't fall into the sink and like a tooth chip or something. So you guys just kind of were pretty much out of time. So you just have to read through these, um, all of these cleansing um, things that you wanna make sure that the patients are aware of. Um, they still need to come in for recall, even if they have no teeth. We need to, the doctor wants to see them at least once a year, even if they have no teeth. Um, some of this stuff, and that's the last one. So there is in the clinic manual, there's um, a whole thing on how you guys handle prosthesis in clinic, because you will see them. Trey, go ahead. Is it, did they change it? Thank you. I will change that. Um, 92 or 93? He, Cause he's like read the clinic manual. Good job, Trey. I know Gail would be just like blowing. It's, that clinic manual is full of good advice. Okay, so that is as far as we can get today. So review these PowerPoints really well. You have, you know, this week and next week, and then, um, and then the following week is an exam. So that just seems bizarre. So I will send you guys out ASAP, definitely by midweek. I will send you guys out. Um, is that true? That can't be true. We don't have, an, no, we have an exam week five. So we talk about pregnancy and diabetes, and then we have an but I think what I'm going to do is I am going to, because I feel like this is kind of nutso, I'm going to create a study guide for these four PowerPoints that kind of help kind of traverse this material for you guys a little bit. But I feel like that's a lot. So you're welcome. Okay. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Okay. I just wanted to, oh, let me stop the recording. Just because I think it would be.